The BYO Biz Speaking from Experience Lecture Series brings leading entrepreneurs and executives to Champlain College to share their experience, wisdom, and insights with students, faculty, staff, and members of the community. Tonight we present social media entrepreneur Laura Fitton. Sometimes you get lucky in life, okay? And I got lucky about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, when I was, uh, I was director of this little startup, this tech startup, and I was uh, down visiting the company and walking around. Uh, it was sort of a barn where they were trying to do this thing, and I ran into Laura. And Laura was a, uh, a recent college graduate, and we sort of went to the same school, so you know how you sort of connect, and uh, we started chatting. And you could tell after about 10 <coughs> seconds that Laura was really smart and really ambitious in a very good way and just had the right edge on her that you could imagine, although I didn't think about it at the time, um, uh, spiral forward 10, 15 years, whatever it's been. And I run into Laura in Boston uh, seeing when I was researching Techstars and she had been in the Techstars program in Boston with her company and uh, gave her a call and learned the whole story about Laura and what she'd done. And with hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, you said, of course, <laughs> why not? <laughs> and uh, so with that, I'm gonna introduce so uh, Laura Fitton. We're so happy that you came up <coughs> to Vermont, braved the uh, winter March weather. <laughs> it's great. And, um, and Laura's gonna tell her, tell you her story. And it's a great story. And, uh, and not only how you've shaped your life, but how you become, can we say it? The Twitter queen? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the record, I'm pretty sure Gaga has the that Twitter now. Twitter queen, but... right here. Thank you, Bob. Bob has always been incredibly, incredibly kind to me. My first meeting in New York City ever. I was a nervous wreck. I was coming from Princeton, where I'd been, of all things, rock climbing on the outside of the library. And we were being paid to do that, to inspect the outside. And all I had was hiking boots. So I'd like, run into a shoe store, buy a pair of shoes. And we walk into this meeting together, and I have a shoe box with my hiking boots in it. Um, we'll never forget that. I mean, it was on my birthday, too. And they took me for cake afterwards. Um, so I have a little agenda here to sort of structure this. Uh, this talk is going to be a mix of what the heck happened to you, what's your story, and what the heck about Twitter, why do you think it's such a big deal, why are others thinking it's such a big deal, you know, it has six, sixth anniversary yesterday, did you guys know that? Happy birthday, Twitter. We all had toasts on campus, right? right? Maybe it was just my mom and I. Um, and I'm going to kind of race through, how long do you want this to go until? Because I have a lot of different speeds. And I want to get to questions. So I want to make sure they get some question time. Why don't you read the audience when they start to look like they're dozing off or something? What time did you tell them they'd be able to go home, Bob? About 8.30. OK. I'd say go, go a half hour, 40 minutes, if you have that much, and then let the questions rip. If you see everybody starting to go like this, you know, tweeting, yeah. tweeting, <laughs> then that might be a cue that maybe they're not listening to you. So. so everybody raise your hand, please. All right, leave your hand up if you're on Twitter. Nice. All right. Hands down, hands back up if you're not on Twitter yet. Cool. Um, those of you who are not on Twitter yet, if you get overcome by the urge to sign up for Twitter during this talk, which I'm sure you all will, um, I want to start by placing a gem out there that Twitter, one of the reasons I got so excited about it, there's a lot of them, but one of them is it is SMS enabled. So you can have a live audience you're speaking to sign up for Twitter right there from any of five billion with a B phones in the world, right? And that's been possible for six years. It's just that people don't really know about it. Um, you could take your phone out and send a text message to the local short code. For the US, it's 40404, just saying the word join. And it pings you back, says, what do you want for a username? What do you want for a password? And boom, your audience is suddenly all on this platform where they can connect to each other, which is a really interesting thing. The other really interesting thing about a very seemingly trivial thing I've just bored you with is that that means five billion with a B people in the world can be publishers right now with technology that's six years old. 
Now, those of us who are old enough to have had to put up a website of any kind in 1996 or 97 or 98 can appreciate that being able to send four text messages and you suddenly have a page up on the web that anybody in the world can link to, that anybody in the world can find, is really bloody huge. And um, that's one of the reasons Twitter has so much potential upside to become a disruptive force. Because even you know Facebook, huge critical mass, right? But it's, it's got a ceiling called the browser. There just aren't nearly as many browsers as there are phones by an order of you know, five, like a billion versus five billion. So some cool stuff. All right, let me jump in, and I, I will try and remember not to touch this mic. First of all, why does a grown professional woman who used to be CEO of a VC funded startup and wrote a book and all this let people call her a nut to her face? Uh, true story. People are much more likely to run up to me and say, hey, pistachio than to say Laura. So this is me now. Um, I've been very lucky. I've had some pretty fun things happen. I'll sort of deconstruct what they were. Uh, my startup 140 was acquired by HubSpot right before I ran into Bob again in uh, August, and I'm at HubSpot now. This was me not that long ago, five years ago. Um, true question. I told this story at dinner. I got off the phone with an old mentor that Bob and I both know who was telling me, well, media is being really disrupted by Web 2.0. I turned to my then husband and said, fine, where do I download the browser upgrade so I can see the 2.0 stuff? And he's like, yeah, <laughs> no. And you know, business blogging was already a huge thing in 2007, and I had been just dipping my toes in blogging. So I was actually fairly late to the social media game. I just got really excited about it. I blogged how stupid Twitter is. I had no connections. I had been working in Pennsylvania my whole career and had essentially dropped out to have kids, was out of the workforce two and a half years, moved to Boston, didn't know anybody. And in five short years, I went from that to you know less than a year later, the guy who wrote Naked Conversations pulled me up onto his blog and started telling this story that someone had Twittered their way out of obscurity. Um, it was true. One of the first people that I went after because he was criticizing Twitter during a conference and sent him like my blog post is this you know crazy wonderful awesome guy named Guy Kawasaki who's a big tech evangelist and marketing guy and stuff. And uh, not only did he listen to my wild-eyed ideas, but he blogged about the fact that I was the one who got him on Twitter. And then he turned around and started introducing me to people, and it got really insane. It was really through the looking glass because next thing I knew. Um, you know, Seth Godin, I'd been reading his blog forever. I thought the guy was kind of a demigod, Wizard of Oz. I'd seen him speak once. People started DMing me, which is the private message uh, feature of Twitter, and saying, how do you know Seth Godin? I'm like, I don't. They're like, yeah, you do. You're in his book. Um, April 2009, shaking in my knees, I got a chance to go in and deliver the first Twitter for Business lecture at HBS. Um, never would have made it into the school. and. April 2009, Twitter was still on the bubble. It was still not that mainstreamish that it was going to be important to businesses. And I was seriously scared they were going to throw rotten tomato. So you know, luckily, I gambled my career on Twitter and not on Plurk, which in the same month, May 2008, <coughs> May 2008, Twitter was down 6% of the month. Twitter was on its knees technologically. And this little unknown micro-sharing site called Plurk came out of nowhere and reached parity with Twitter's numbers during the month where I'm like, I'm going to start the first Twitter for Business thing and sign this contract to write Twitter for Dummies. And Wiley pulled back the contract for six months because they were like, eh, we're on uh, Twitter, not so much. Um, so been incredibly lucky. Uh, there is ridiculous amounts of hype, uh, largely because I'm a woman and you know, largely because I was kind of, any Elle Woods fans here? You know, the, the, this is the movie Legally Blonde. And there's a moment in the movie where these two you know, older lawyers are leaning against the wall and looking at each other and going, do you think she just woke up one morning and said, I'll go to Harvard Law School? I just kind of woke up one morning and said, I'm going to do a startup. Um, so you know, I've been very lucky. I'm very grateful for all the hype, but don't ever believe the hype, even if it's about you. So how did all that happen? Why? How was this possible? Well, the nature of media is shifting in ways that make mere mortals have much more leverage than they used to. Um, 
This is a cartoonist that my company, HubSpot, commissioned from a really awesome guy named Hugh McLeod. He's at Gaping Void on Twitter. If you don't know his work, it's really fun. He really pushes, I know there's a lot of marketing majors here, he really pushes the boundaries on how media is changing, how marketing is changing, why marketing is changing, and what we can do about it productively. Um, so let's dig into the Twitter slice of how media has changed forever. A lot of what I'm going to say does work on other platforms, um, but for obvious reasons, everything I talk about is pretty Twitter-centric, so I'm this like, Twitter Cinderella story. Um, so for the Twitter skeptics that are all still out there, and it's a very valid position, a position I held once, um, <coughs> it's important to open your mind about Twitter. This is a quote from Charlene Lee, who wrote a pretty important book about social business while she was still at Forrester and has gone on to write Open Leadership. Um, the metaphor I started using pretty early on was to encourage people to think of this not as a social network or a platform or a micro blog, which was the, the common name early, but a global sensing and signaling network. And you know, even when Twitter was really at sample size level, like only a few million people doing it, we were getting crazy interest in weather data out of the world, financial data out of the world, news data out of the world, political data out of the world. Um, certainly the, the Arab Spring and before that the Green Revolution in Iran started to give the world a taste of what happens when five billion people can be publishers. Um, this is a company in New York that about a year ago launched themselves with this amazing, like, kind of brain-shattering uh, case study. What they do is they watch the Twitter fire hose. They watch all the data, which is, I, I think, I remember it took three and a half years to get to a billion tweets, and I remember having a slide in my deck. I was like, wait a minute, a billion tweets! And I, I showed Jack's first tweet, and then I showed a billion. There's a billion tweets every three days now. So these guys are watching all that with real high-end algorithms, and their customers, at the time of the story I'm going to tell, it was five private equity firms, but our giant financial services industry clients. It took them 19 tweets to surmise that Osama was probably dead, and they sent an alert to those private equity, which, you know, they're in the business of arbitrage and global trading and understanding how news is going to affect the economy, 18 minutes ahead of the news breaking. 18 minutes in the financial services industry is like three years. Um, and that was just watching tweets. So one of the interesting lessons I pull out of the chaos and try to explain to people that I think makes Twitter cool is it subverts the influencer paradigm, right? To use big fancy college words. It, it, the whole, like, you need an influencer to tell the world how things should be. Eh. You know, this guy who took this picture, which I guarantee is anybody in this room not seen this picture before today, right? This picture was all over the wire within 20 minutes of it being discovered on Twitter. The guy had 29 followers. He was no how, no way connected. He was no how, no way an influencer. <laughs> but what happened was somebody in an office building in New York looked out the window, probably thought several expletives, which I'll, I'll spare you, and then thought, I bet there's something about that on Twitter, and went searching, right? So again, accidental publisher Seriously, like Pulitzer level photojournalist by the time he got off the ferry. And it wasn't because he was influential, it was because the message was incredible. A message that's amazing can permeate the entire network. And remember that little pebble versus the big stack of pebbles? The principle I'm illustrating here is something called, that I call any to many. So we had one to many in the, in the days of mass media. You could buy your way onto the television and control access to that audience. Well, we can't really predict with technologies like Twitter where that next thing everybody focuses on is going to come from. And that's what happened in the case of the airplane. And that's also what happened. Any astronomy people here? Probably not. You know which nebula this is? <laughs> it's not at all. It's a map of a tweet exploding into the network. And the particular tweet was, uh, again, this is actually drawn from the time. This is research pulled by a company called Social Flow in New York. Um, and they just wanted to study this thesis about, you know, oh, some influencer tweets something and that's when the news breaks. Well, no, there was no mathematical way to predict that Keith Urban, 
would be the guy who tweeted the tweet that leaked the Osama news, right? But he was. He wasn't the first person with political connections to speculate on it. He wasn't the first, you know, there were some journalists like with huge followings who had speculated on it. But for whatever reason, his was the tipping point that caused this, you know, Cambrian explosion. That, I think the event horizon on that is like five minutes, right? It's incredibly fast. Um, I don't have this slide anymore because it's so outdated, but very, very early on, the first big earthquake that was documented on Twitter, you know, people were like, ah, yeah, within two minutes, it was clear something was going on. But if you looked very carefully at the math, there was a point of inflection, you know, tenths of a second in where it started to break upwards. And, the, and I looked at that and said, there's going to be technology someday that can do what, what data miner now does, like sniff the canary in the coal mine early on. Um, one last piece of evidence about the five billion, I sound like my old Professor Carl Sagan, billion uh, publishers. This guy was in a coffee shop overhearing the raid. He didn't know what he was overhearing. The news didn't break based on these tweets, but these tweets were immediately retrievable once people started to piece the story together. And next thing you know, this guy is the on-scene witness of choice for hundreds of news agencies all over the world who are getting in touch with him because of his Twitter account. They can reach him, they can find him, they can figure out who he is. Some really, really interesting things because the system's so lightweight and so easy to throw stuff up there, any tweet is a web page. It has a unique resource locator and it can be linked to still. Yesterday, we all were retweeting the first tweet. It was status update number 29, and you can still go to it, link to it, like it, favorite it. It still exists as an object on the web. Um, so some pretty cool stuff. So summing this into how it's changing the economic forces of media is that where influence in the one-to-many world was wholly dependent on your ability to attract attention to yourself, influence in the any-to-many world is actually inverted. It's actually the more you can provide attention to other people, value to other people, be enthusiastic about what other people are doing, enlist the help of many people together to accomplish something, um, that's where influence comes from these days, both in the message itself rather than the messenger and in the kind of selflessness of it. Um, South by Southwest is a conference down in Texas, originally film and music, now has a huge interactive component. Um, and actually, that's, that's another Twitter for Business case study. They had maybe 3,000 attendees for the interactive component when Twitter first broke as a story five years ago. <clears throat> and so many people at the conference were tweeting what they were doing that it turned into the world's biggest tweet up. Like people started going who had nothing to do with the interactive industry because they wanted to meet all their friends on Twitter they'd been following. It's now 35,000 people in six years. It, it went from 3,000 to 35,000. I don't know what's going to happen next year. It's going to be like 70,000 people. Austin's just not that big. Um, but you know, some, some incredibly fascinating things that become possible when you share your light with other people. Um, so three things I would love the business world to stop asking about Twitter. Um, does it matter? Well, we have some interesting data that was just released by HubSpot not too long ago where businesses, you know, 89% of them were calling Twitter at least useful, 36% calling it important or critical to their business. Um, people still like to say, ah, you know, I don't know if my customers are on Twitter. Um, two ways to address that. One is, frankly, there's still five great uses of Twitter even if none of your customers are there you can get great SEO out of it. If you don't believe me, Google the word pistachio. <laughs> it is mine. <laughs> that poor net company with the really weird, you know, get Kraken ads, like they had to sign up for something else and I still beat them on the Google results half the time. Um, you know, getting to journalists, you can do, I call it inbound PR, right? If you get excited and put your ideas out there, the journalists find you or you can stalk them very gently, right? Like keep an eye on what they're saying, what they're doing, and notice they're working on a story that you might want to pitch them on. Um, so SEO, just just plain word of mouth, because you know, let's face it, the people on Twitter are pretty gabby. Um, PR, doing research, right? Asking a question and giving people something they can use to answer that question in a group, and it's called a hashtag. It's really just the pound sign and any word you want to use. And the humble hashtag has turned into 
So many different uses, I'll give you just one of them. It's the Lions Club of the future. There's 600 weekly recurring professional associations that meet on Twitter simply by following a hashtag at an agreed upon time. Um, the one I run, is, it's not really a professional association in my case, it's called Beyond Fire. I read this blog post about startups where he said, look, startups are hard, you have to be burning, you have to be on fire. And I loved the blog post so much, I said, this is a Twitter chat. And we started it New Year's Day, actually the day after New Year's Day, so it's very, very recent. The reach of our last one, and this is just you know all of us sitting down at our computers for an hour on a Monday night, the reach of our last one was 10 million, right? Without any budget, any central organizing, sanctioning body, just us going like, hey, let's talk about what it takes to get fired up and motivated. So even with that, right? 44% of customers have straight up acquired a customer off Twitter across all segments. When you narrow that down to retail, 70% of retail and wholesale companies have straight up acquired a customer on Twitter. Um, and then the other question, I really am killing the audio for the video because I keep hitting that mic, sorry. The other question I really wish people would stop asking. I really wish Twitter would take that number of followers thing and just hide it somewhere. It's so front and center and people, like intelligent, wonderful people, possibly including the Harvard Business School professor who invited me in to speak at that class, worry so much about their followings. And it's, I try and help them with this. And I say, look, you know, have you done email marketing? And they're like, yeah, you know, I'm like, have you ever bought a list of emails? Which, by the way, is a pretty bad idea because most of the lists are pretty cruddy. I'm like, asking how you get more Twitter followers is like asking that person you're buying the list from, well, can I buy six million instead of one million? Like, that list isn't necessarily gonna perform any better because it's untargeted, it's, it's spam harvest, it's, it's just junk. And more isn't going to make it better. What's really important on Twitter is not just, you know, you're following, but engaging people and really providing them with something and giving them something to talk about and giving them a reason to come back. They are one click away from unfollowing your business or your project or your personality or you. And you must constantly be thinking about putting them front and center and making them the big story. Um, to get some tips on how to do this, let's turn back to good old Ben Franklin, who turns out to be a social media guru. Twitter can be thought of as a collection of remarks, right? Pretty fair description of it. So that means you're thinking about what is remarkable, what is inherently likely to generate other people making remarks about it. And you know, for the, I, I don't like reading my slides, but this one's worth reading in case the font's too small. Either write something worth reading or do something worth writing about. You know, you've heard content is king, you've heard me say, the messenger is now the influencer. I'm sorry, the message is now the influencer. Um, something we like, this is a little more Hugh McLeod, Gaping Void Art. Something we like to talk about at HubSpot is creating stuff that people love to receive. So getting away from the world where people are saying, you know, no, no, no more marketing messages to, I don't know if I have these slides in here, but like a little girl with a candy box going, yes, I wanted this. Um, so back on that South By story, there was a lot of debate heading into South By. How are brands going to market themselves at South By Southwest? What are they going to do? What are they best? What's the best way to market yourself at South By? And I said, you know, it's the same best way to market yourself anywhere. Show up and make yourself useful. Because the selfish marketer is going to utterly, utterly fail now that media works the way it does. Every time. You know, and, and so my, my title at HubSpot is Inbound Marketing Evangelist. So I'm selling this idea of like create great content, get people to show up, but not just stopping there. Make sure they convert and make sure you're analyzing what you're doing. And so people say, oh great, inbound, that's the opposite of outbound. Like advertising is outbound, right? And advertising is bad. And I say, whoa, whoa, whoa no, 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 no. Don't condemn it just because it's advertising. You can still make really inbound advertising, right? If you're sending, and think Super Bowl ads here, right? Sending out something really awesome people really want to see. It doesn't matter if your tactic is push, if the content is fantastic. So I challenge everybody, um, look, you know, you're not straight up a business audience where you all own companies, so I won't do the raising hand thing that I sometimes do. But when you think about a product or a service or a company, most companies are useful in solving a problem. 
most products are useful in, in solving a problem to someone or they wouldn't work, but most marketing materials aren't really solving anybody's problem except for the person who created them. And increasingly, they're not doing that very well either. So if you can create marketing materials that somebody would pay you to receive, or if you're working on a marketing campaign, think about it this way. You want something that the guy overhears you on the train talking about and like follows you off the train and says, hey, I, I want some of that. That sounded amazing, right? That's what we mean when we say make marketing people really love. So what are some ways to measure yourself and see how you're doing at this? <coughs> Because we always try and drink our own champagne and walk our own walk at HubSpot, one of our big marketing initiatives is this free, simple grader that you can run any website in the world through. You can run your competitors. You can run, if you're doing research for a new business plan, you can run big brands. We, we sit around the office and we like run Coke versus Pepsi and you know kind of do head-to-head -head things. It takes about 12 seconds to run, and it gives you about you know, depending on the consultant you hired, about five to twelve thousand dollars worth of detailed analysis of ninety-nine different points of your marketing, your social media marketing, your website performance, and tactical ideas on what you can do. So when we go to a trade show, we don't run around and try and scan people's badges and go like, ha ha, give us your lead, we're gonna market you to death. We offer to run a free report and like, do you want the data? Cool. Go be a better marketer. And if you come back to us later and say, I need your all-in-one marketing software to be a better marketer, cool. If we never see you again, cool. You don't even notice the email address field is optional. We don't even force people to give us their lead information to use this tool. We believe in providing something awesome that is going to help people whether they ever become a customer or not. And that's how we want you to think about your marketing. Make marketing people love that's genuinely useful to others. <coughs> Oh, I do have the screaming lady. She's coming up in a minute. So this concept of inbound marketing, you, you've probably heard a lot about social media marketing and content marketing, right? We see those as tools, very important tools, but tools in the arsenal of how you do inbound. You're going to see this slide a bunch of times as a map. I know it's a little bit of a complex slide. So starting with that first column, that's where you're doing your social media marketing, your content marketing, your blogging, your Facebooking. You want to get found in the first place. But a lot of people stop there, and a lot of people go, yeah, I had this great blog post. It got 10,000 visits. And then you say, well, how many leads did it generate? And how many customers resulted? And they're like, I don't know. And then they have this other blog post on their blog that only ever got 500 visits, and they think it's a total dog, right? Except that those 500 people, 75 of them were good leads, and five of them became customers. So if you're not measuring, if you're only measuring get found, and you're not measuring convert, you're really missing out, and you're not nearly as strategic about how to build your business. And then, of course, analyze, right? The analytics component, and I'm so thrilled there's a marketing analytics course here at the college now. I think that's outstanding. It's so important because it's so easy to measure the wrong stuff. It's so easy to measure really meaningless stuff that isn't going to get you to that convert goal. Um, so the other way to define inbound marketing, besides, you know, this is the technical grid, get found, convert, analyze, is less of this, isn't she cute? Isn't she adorable, right? Could people feel that way about the next piece of marketing you generate? That's the goal I want to set for all of you. So to boil all this down into just two words, that's really it. Show up and make yourself useful. Be useful. You want the 601? You want a more detailed? OK, two words. That's not really enough. Give me some more. All right, fine. Here is a sophisticated Twitter or insert social media platform here marketing program for you. These four steps in this order and cycling back through it constantly. You listen first. You learn from what you're listening. You really care and really try and show people that you care. And you serve, which of course is just a one word version of be useful, right? So what do I mean by this? Well, start with listen. Have any of you ever worked a room at a cocktail party, right? Maybe some of the students haven't done this yet, right? But you don't walk into the room and just beeline over to a group and be like, I'm Laura Fitt and I work for HubSpot. It's really great to meet you. I love the color of that shirt you're wearing. Do you want to buy my product? And Every company is doing social media like this. 
right? No, here's how you walk into a cocktail party. You, oh, they look interesting. And you stand near them and next to them. And you tune in to what's being discussed. And you hear the cadence. How do they speak to each other? What kinds of vocabulary do they use? How are they dressed? What topics are they talking about? And if it seems like a good fit and you have something to say, you add to the conversation. Right? So you listen first. We know we listen first. You, know, you can do any number of hackneyed things here, right? Two ears, one mouth. You listen first and get a sense for what's going on. Learn, of course, is the world should see that you're listening and responding in different ways. Right? So if you go out there and you do a blog, and the first version of your company blog is kind of you know, press page 2.0, right? it's just a bunch of stories about your company and, and releases and nobody's reading them and nobody's sharing them on social networks, then learn from that and try something different. Care is a huge one. <clears throat> I finally got to sit down with two of my friends from Dell, uh, Lionel and Richard Van Hammer. I think they're Lionel at Dell and Richard at Dell on Twitter, um, and ask them the real skinny on what went down at Dell in 2005, 2006, when Jeff Jarvis got pissed about his laptop breaking. So basically, one of the reasons you're so sick of hearing Dell as a social media case study, they screwed the pooch first, right? They messed up so badly, and they got roasted for it. They got absolutely destroyed. And now they're the best in the world, and that's not a coincidence. They've just had more time. So you get a lot of companies that are like, yeah, we know we need to do this social media stuff, but we're really scared. What happens if there's a disaster and a backlash? Win. If there's a disaster and a backlash, and you show you cared, and you try better the next time, you go to the top of the heap. I mean, it's, it's fantastic how well this third piece, care, really works. Um, and serve, I think I've already done to death, right? Make marketing people love. Put something out there that people need. The first, um, a lot of early Twitter dogma was like, oh, you have to be conversational and personality-based, or your account will never take off. Tell that to at Dell Outlet, which sold $500,000 worth of computers to about 300 people. It wasn't because they had great personality. It was because they had great discounts. And people were excited and forwarding those discounts to everybody they knew. Because it was you know, 2007, and we didn't have Groupon <laughs> yet. It was just like, wow, I can get a Dell computer for 30% off right now. I want to be the good guy who shares this with somebody else. It's a great piece of content. If you're not sure what to write about as you approach these platforms, here is you know, the best advice I can give you. And this comes from a woman named Ann Handley. She's at Marketing Profs on Twitter. Uh, this one often gets I, I point that out because it often gets tweeted during talks and credited to me, and it's not me. Even if you're in an industry where you can't necessarily disclose full details on who your customers are, or they really don't want to be profiled as a case study on your blog, you can pull data, you can generalize. Absolutely, the story you need to be telling is how somebody kicked butt because of your product, not how your product kicks butt, not how you kick butt. Why? Well, it's just not about you on these medium. I challenge people to turn their message inside out. You could have a blog, and I'll give you a little, anybody know what A-B testing is? You have two different versions of some things so that you can see how they perform relative to each other. Let's run a little informal A-B test right here. We're, we're setting up a Twitter account to promote a blog. Twitter account A, title, link. Title, link. Title, link. Every time a blog post goes up. Valid. Probably performs OK, especially if you're a good copywriter and your titles are good. Twitter account B, provocative question about the reader link that's on the same topic as what the blog post is. Nugget of data they haven't heard before that's astonishing that's in the blog post and link. Question about how they might apply the skills covered in the blog post and link, right? So Twitter account B is all about the reader. Everything in there is centered on the person consuming it, where Twitter account A is all about the writer. So it's just a matter of whether you think of it as mirror image, as this slide demonstrates, or what I've often said, which is turning your message inside out and making it about the audience. I'll give you a totally banal example of what I mean here. Um, I, I am a mom. I'm a single mom of two very little kids. And when I was first getting started on Twitter, I remember this day so clearly, my two-year-old fell off a chair. 
Now, there was all kinds of backstory where she's very accident prone and we'd had to deal with like doctors in the state before. So I was freaking out because she fell off a chair. <clears throat> I did not tweet. Well, first of all, I picked her up first, made sure she was okay. I did not tweet, oh my God, my daughter fell off a chair. Oh, you know. I tweeted, what do you do when you're suddenly startled and scared out of your hide? Right? And 75 people got into the conversation. They're like, oh my god, here's what I do, here's what I do. Oh, what happened? Oh, and they, they drew the story out of me because I was talking about them, not about me. Um, another time, I was out for a walk with my girls and like, oh, you know, here's a twit pic of my grandmother's quilt and you know, here's a pretty view with boats. And I thought people would be fascinated by the charmingness of it all, right? No. It was when I started pitching rocks in the water and said, what is it about humans that we love throwing rocks in the water? That again, a group of about 90 people jumped on the tweet and started talking, not just to me, but to each other. Because I had gotten to a very fundamental human experience that they had also had. Um, so my other decks get into this very touchy-feely stuff about Twitter runs on love and, you know, Twitter is all about what do we have in common. It really is. Um, things that work well on Twitter are the same things that work well in stand-up comedy. A another one of my like surprisingly most popular tweets ever. I was getting ready for a keynote. I was in my hotel room. I needed coffee badly. And I tweeted, you know, the only problem with hotels is you need pants to get coffee. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I wasn't trying. I was just like, really what I thought. And like, it got retweeted and favorited. And I was, I was pretty surprised. And I realized, oh, it's just absurd enough that it's funny, but it's something we've all experienced. If we do any kind of business travel, it's like, oh, I really need my coffee, but I can't go there in my bathrobe. Um, so finding the things you have in common with the audience. And you won't, and this is why the number of followers thing is so misguided, you won't have things in common with in the entire audience. You don't need to. You need to find the right audience for what you're trying to do, whether it's a nonprofit that you're trying to raise money for, whether it's an educational program you're trying to get interest in, whether it's a business you're trying to get customers for. It's all about finding the right people, not just finding the most people. Um, I'm going to flash real quick through a couple different Twitter for Business tools for those of you who are interested in kind of pursuing more deeply the business use of Twitter. This is Twitter's own site, business.twitter.com. Um, they have a number of different products promoting tweets, promoting trends, and promoting <coughs> accounts. Um, some companies have had fantastic success with them, generally the companies that are pretty good at Twitter to begin with. Um, some have said, eh, you know, not so much, but it's, it's stuff you can look into and learn about for your business. Um, I will post these slides so you can get them because that little link in the corner links to the, the article behind this with specific tactical advice on how you can be using products like promoted tweets. Um, you really want to understand who your followers are and make sure that the growth of your account is attracting the right types of followers. You can do that through Twitter's own analytics. Honestly, I do it by seeing are people clicking my links or not. Use a trackable link shortener like a bit.ly or whatever's built into Hootsuite if you use Hootsuite or CoTweet so you can see. You know, when I tweet it this way, nobody cares, nobody responds, nobody repeats it, nobody favorites it. When I do it this way, it gets a lot of resonance and people click through to the target. Um, understanding, you know, <laughs> Twitter's own website analytics are going to help you, even if you're not promoting on Twitter, understand how other people are finding you via Twitter. It's a pretty big source of traffic um, and there's a lot of other new, well, uh, let's talk about Pinterest for a minute. <laughs> How about that coming out of left field? On our own blog on HubSpot, Pinterest is now driving more visits and leads than our entire PR effort. It's, it's crazy. So you know, keep an open mind to where things can come from. But in particular, you know, the other thing about Twitter traffic when you're analyzing your site is that it's often underreported because it's coming from third party clients that are using the Twitter data. So take whatever is obviously coming from Twitter in your analytics and multiply it times two. And again, for those of you not doing a lot for your business with Twitter right now, this may give you reason when you look at the data to think, well, we should kind of figure out how to harness that. Um, again, this is just a peek at what Twitter is going to have for their analytics. Um, this is a reminder that you're all welcome to use this marketing grader tool for your own properties and sites. It's just marketing.grader.com. This is a cool, you probably have seen someone using Storify and maybe didn't know you were seeing it. 
when you see an article on the New York Times or on someone's blog and it has a lot of tweets embedded in it, uh, often it's been built with something like Storify that lets you pull the tweets out that you want to do, editorially curate them, feature the media that they link to if they link to a photo or a video, and deliver a human readable experience out of Twitter. Twitter's biggest problem in my mind, aside from sort of killing off its ecosystem, is that when you go to YouTube, you don't think, eh, no point in being here, I don't post videos. You have so much else to do as a consume-only experience, and Twitter has not reached a lot of good consume-only experiences. So what Storify lets you do, um, I'll skip ahead a couple. This is a site called Twyla. <clears throat> very, very interesting if you're interning at a small business to show them, even a big business, Whole Foods is actually a big user of this. It basically creates a website out of any Twitter account. It sorts out all the categories you've been tweeting about, constructs a nav bar, and lays out the content beautifully. It looks like a newspaper um, for any brand, any product, anything that's been tweeting. Really, really powerful and amazing. Um, another tool for those of you doing PR or at a company where you want to reach out to journalists, Muckrack documents all the journalists who are on Twitter. And like every day I get an email from Muckrack telling me not only who are the journalists that are tweeting, but what they're tweeting about. So I have an opportunity, like, wow, that news story is really relevant to the PR I'm doing for my company. I'm going to contact that journalist who was just tweeting about it. So when you think about Twitter, don't just think about the straight up tweet, follow, obvious consumption on Twitter.com experience. There's a lot of different other ways to use it. I'm going to wrap up on a little bit of a woo-woo note. Um, a couple things that, you know, especially for the students out there, I want you to take away from my story. Um, this is a tweet I sent, well, the date's on there, but uh, it doesn't say what year. Actually, I don't even remember what year. The people who lined up behind me and believed in what I was saying and told me they did were the only reason I could keep going because I kept running into brick walls. And the thing about brick walls is you have to run all the way into them. Too many people in the world hold themselves back by going, well, there's a brick wall over there. There's no sense in running that way. And honestly, half the time you get there and there's like a path around it or a ladder going over it or something they didn't see. Now half the time you run into the wall, you bleed, you fall down, you cry, <laughs> but you get back up and you keep going. And a lot of times the difference is just that somebody has told you they believe in you. So whenever you get a chance, tell them that. And I'll give you an example of how people resonate with each other on Twitter. Joey Leslie added such a great dimension to what I was trying to say. Just keep doing it. Um, a challenge for me in the last five years, the biggest challenge that I'm still fighting every day, is just coming to terms with who you really are and what you really want to do in the world. When I'm in tune on that, I'm unstoppable. But I was basically in neutral for 37 years before all this happened, right? So it wasn't like I suddenly became a different person with different abilities. I just finally tapped into something I really, really wickedly cared about. And that made all the difference. So I think the central challenge in life is learning not to be afraid of who you are. I break that out on my, um, again, there's a link to it. It's a little hard to write down, but I'll, I'll send out these slides. On my Posturous account, I wrote these down at random one day when I was really, really struggling with the startup early on. And I keep looking back at them and saying, well, I'll have to change them at some point because I just blurted these all out for a webinar. But these really are the things that I've followed that have worked for me. Figure out what yours are, because yours are different than mine, and that's cool, and that's really super important to have a sense of who you are, what you're driven by values-wise. Um, so that's it for the you know, kind of formal content. Quick recap of what HubSpot does, if you're curious, because we do a lousy job of explaining it. Um, there's just so many different ways to market now, and we're the only all-in-one platform that lets you do it all from one place. Um, it is a phenomenal place to work. For those of you graduating in the next couple of years, give me a call. Um, incredible people, incredibly enthusiastic. I mean, look at Orange Guy, right? That's an employee who loves HubSpot so freaking much. Um, we, we, had a, we had a news story we saw yesterday. It was actually a really sad news story, so we didn't do anything with it. 14 employees in a law firm in Florida were fired for all wearing orange to work because they were going out to a happy hour together later and management thought it was a protest. We were all like, orange, yes, we love orange. You know, it's like, okay guys, read the story. It's actually really sad. 
But uh, it's a fun place to work, and it's fun. We're the second fastest growing software company, which is overwhelming. But the real story here is that. I came into this company in the middle of the Occupy movement breaking out in Boston. I was seeing people on the streets screaming about the economy, and I was seeing our 6,000 customers grow. And that is what gets me up every morning. That's what gets me excited, because to put America, now I'm going to sound all political, but to put America back to work, we need entrepreneurs. We need people to understand how to grow their business. And I think making marketing people love is a, a standing way to do that. Stop wasting people's time and haranguing them with your marketing and give them something they want. So thank you, everybody else, for your attention. And let's get some questions. the economy crumbling, and I'm not an economist, but I go, right, I'm a child in the 70s, I remember before credit cards, I remember after credit cards. So basically we thought, let's extend everybody a ton of credit, and with our advertising, make them feel like shit about themselves. Because that's going to end well. <laughs> so thank you for that add-on. Um, I'm Adriel Olson, I'm an MFA emergent media grad student here at Checkway. And uh, we've been talking in our classes a lot about how Twitter is a conversation, a dialogue with everyone. And I did a project on digital identity and by myself on Twitter and by myself in real life. And I don't know if you can think about that, about how are you projecting yourself? Because a lot of students in the room, including myself, and sometimes I'm now off and I'm like, I can't take that back. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, because I am getting into marketing thoughts, um, how do you, what do you think about that? What are your thoughts or suggestions about? identity and yourself and all that. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic question. If everybody heard it, um, she's asking about you know identity, right? Everything you're putting out there is you and is findable again later and is you know probably not how you speak six years from now, but it's still going to be out there. Um, <clears throat> I, I think about it a lot, right? Because the people closest to me just tease me all the time. They're like, yeah, well, there's Laura and there's Pistachio. And they're not saying that pistachio is a disingenuous version of Laura. It's not like I'm going on stage and putting on a wig and trying to be a different person over there. It's just that you know, I'm not going to say certain things because I, I'm aware there's an audience there. right? And there are certain projections and expectations on pistachio. And, and also, I just don't like to internalize, like, I have followers. Like, no, the account has readers. Right? And that's different from who I am when I wake up in the morning. Not because I'm faking it, but because it's just it's a different thing. And people project a lot of expectations on it and a lot of excitement around it. And I'm super grateful to be in this, this tornado of everything that goes on with it. Um, but I also have a hopefully healthy sense of perspective that that's not me. And that's not necessarily something I built. It's something a community built. And you know, a lot of people working together in different ways built. Um, and then, of course, the other thing about identity, and I love, am I allowed to say your sabbatical book topic? Sure. Okay. I love that Elaine is going to write a piece to help people understand how to think about curating their digital personalities and their online presence and like, yeah, you know, that picture of you barfing at the party, I, it's awesome, but maybe not. Like, maybe keep that one pretty locked down because you don't want it there 50 years from now when you're old like me and trying to apply for a job somewhere. At the same time, culture itself is going to have to shift, right? Because we got by the Kennedy era by going like, oh, yeah, yeah, Marilyn's not in the White House, la, 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 we're not looking, we're not looking. Everybody knew, not everybody, the ordinary populace, but everybody around them knew, just nobody <coughs> talked about it. And then when a scandal did break, we dealt with that by going, oh, oh, yeah, well, that, that was a scandal. We don't have scandals and shoving it aside. So obviously, when you're recruiting a bunch of college students and they all have red solo cup pictures on Facebook, you need to hire somebody, right? 
Um, so I think there'll be a meeting in the middle. And I think it's important, you know, hopefully the topic of your book will be like, you know, cocktail party social, right? <laughs> You're still kind of professional. One of the other funny things about social media, total tangent from your question, so I apologize. Um, I try and help reassure people that they know a lot more about social media than they think they do. Because the use case for me that got me over my Twitter is so freaking stupid was one of the oldest career rules in the book, surround yourself with successful and trusting people. That was it. I was like, wow, this is great. Once, twice a day, I'll log in and I'll see what these people have been doing in their lives. And I know I'm competitive enough to get fired up and think, well, I should go take a networking meeting. Ben just did. That was a great idea. Or, oh my god, Chris just read this article. Or, you know, Bobby just watched this TED talk. It exposed me to things that, you know, and that's, that's an old classic. So we've always known the golf course is very important for business. This idea of socializing and building trust and being a bit silly sometimes isn't new. We always knew the charity event was important. So there's a lot of stuff about real old school business values. Um, our advisor, HubSpot, has Gary Vaynerchuk as an advisor. Anybody here familiar with his work? Yeah, crazy man. If you want, to, you want to see what I'm talking about, come to our conference inbound in August. He's keynoting, and he's just amazing. He's like, our freaking grandparents would be better at social media for business than we are, because they had you know, maybe a, a retail store in a small village, and people weren't going to come buy shoes from them unless they knew how to fit your child and how to help you understand what your child needed for support and be real experts and provide a lot of valuable content along with their services. And when they weren't selling your shoes, they were sitting outside their store paying attention to what was going on around them. Yes. And interacting with the community. <laughs> and, and building trust and relationships and, you know. Other question in the back? Um, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. I've seen this going around on Twitter recently. Um, what are your two cents on employers asking for your Facebook password? And what, what kind of boundaries should there be between what I allow you to see, what I really have going on, and, and what I think you should be privileged to? Yeah, yeah, uh, no, <laughs> no freaking way. You don't want to work for a place that insists, you know, and, and times are hard, right? Not everybody has the luxury of saying, I'm not going to take a job where they want to look at my, my Facebook page. Um, but it's, it's horrifying because Facebook's privacy settings aren't that reliable. My Facebook page is supposedly not searchable and people find it all the time. Um, and it doesn't even have my last name on it, so I have no idea how they're finding it. Um, but you should be able to dial that stuff in. This isn't going to work unless we come up with a social contract that there is a small subset of your friends that get to see the puking into the red solo cup picture, right? Um, so I, I think that was just a travesty, really. And I hope that kind of stuff gets illegal pretty soon. At the same time, you know, for someone who really has to have that job, the employer has a lot of control in that situation, and it's really, you know, pretty unfair. But that's like saying, I, I need to read your diary to hire you. It's, it's a radically private thing. Um, just a comment on that. Um, no. <laughs> Under any circumstances, pretty much, good lawyer. Uh, you should never be asked to divulge any private information to an employer, except for your social security. So they're not allowed to ask you your uh, They're not allowed to ask you any of that stuff. So, <laughs> you know, if they are, they're breaking the law in a number of different ways. They may not be realizing because there isn't a law that says you cannot divulge somebody's like Facebook password. You know that's not okay. But they are breaking the law in terms of confidentiality and respect for employee rights. So don't even go there. Um, seriously, just don't. Do somebody's and the same, same thing goes for signing a document, right? If you don't know what that document means and you don't understand the implications of signing that document, do not sign it. <laughs> okay. Same deal with like the I accept on a software license agreement. If you don't know what that means, don't click it. <laughs> Read the EULA, it matters, right? Read the privacy uh, uh, agreement for Facebook, it will terrify you. Yeah, of Same story with Google, right? If you actually read it and pay attention, you're gonna go, wait, everything I upload, they own? Okay, we have kind of changed that recently. A little retroactive, folks. Yeah. Yes, everything you ever uploaded to Facebook until like six months ago, Facebook 100% owned. And the story, the story that I heard was uh, I was in New York. I was in a retail shop. I love this. Guys like, dude, my friend was walking down the street, stopped at a bus stop, and saw this picture 
on the wall, the bus stop, was at Facebook. He had no contact with Facebook whatsoever. It was one of his pictures from his page, and they just posted it up as marketing materials because he clicked, I accept, right? And that was it. No end of conversation. For those of you like me who totally fog over on legal documents, at the very least, go Google, right? Google, he said EULA, everybody know what that stands for? End User License Agreement, E-U-L-A. So Google and see what bloggers that you trust are writing about these legal agreements before you accept them, right? It's a little bit of a lazy way around it, but it's a whole lot better than just blindly clicking I accept. Um, the other thing about online privacy, I'll say, I did finally have, not finally, it wasn't like I was looking forward to it. I, I did have a stalking incident this winter where a guy was really trying to see me in person and I had been very uncomfortable with him months ago and had asked him to stop contacting me online or anywhere. And uh, I learned pretty quickly that what I've shared on Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare is nothing compared to what the government publishes about me. So your driver's license records, you know, when you buy a house, I wish I had bought my house in the name of a trust because I'm a single mom and you can absolutely find my mortgage, my deed from anywhere in the world by searching Massachusetts records. And so when I had this stalking incident, I took the name of the detective and the case number and everything and I contacted that online database and said, pursuant to online privacy laws, I need you to take my address out of this database. I'm in a situation. They're like, yeah, no, there, there's no such thing. There are no online privacy laws. And so you can pay a couple websites to scrub your public records data off the internet periodically because it's, it's your name, phone number, address. Um, you know, what, what Facebook is controlling and what Google is controlling is nothing compared to what the government is publishing on you. And I'm not that libertarian person who's like, oh, the government. But it was shocking. <laughs> it was totally shocking. So I dealt with it by signing up for a couple of the scrub services and tweeting a lot of pictures of my 120 pound dog and her teeth. <laughs> the guy went away. I, I'm, I'm buying a new car right now. My, my au pair totaled my car. And I haven't told that on social media, but everybody on social media knows my car got totaled and they don't know why. And I want to buy a Mini Cooper, the new 4x4, four four, but I had to first make sure my dog fit in it. And my mother thought I was crazy. I'm like, Mom, the one consistent thing, you remember the dog I owned in Pennsylvania. The one consistent thing in my life for the last 15 years is I've owned a 120 pound dog. So I'm buying my car around the dog for sure. Anyway, back to the topic. Other questions? I don't want to keep you guys here too long. Yes? Um, I must admit, I considered to begin with was this like weird word that was going to go away, and it's not, <laughs> and now I have to learn it. But when do you feel after you put your dip for Twitter? To me, it added no um, credibility whatsoever, and I probably avoided it longer because of him. Yeah. Is that <laughs> He definitely got it into headlines. Um, he was one of the first celebrities to be able to get that level of coverage for Twitter. Um, in general, celebrities are a really interesting use case of Twitter because it gives them the chance to, to buy back or take back a slice of what I think of as the paparazzi economy, right? So for years, the Inquirer and paparazzi have been selling celebrities' private lives for cash. And the celebrity can take it back now and say, so in some, in some ways, some of the stuff he did, even some of the stupider, goofier stuff, was very revolutionary and important. <coughs> that he was saying like, hey, I'm not gonna let a paparazzi take a picture of my wife's derriere, I'm gonna take it, right? On my terms, which, you know, she was obviously good humored enough to go along with it, right? So they were pulling their shenanigans and doing their stunts. And what it meant was they were able to focus incredible amounts of attention on their charitable foundation. They were able to take what would otherwise be sold in the media market without any pennies going anywhere to what they cared about and direct it towards the DNA Foundation to fight you know, child sexual slavery. So that was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, I'm sure there are plenty of people that, like, just like exactly what you said, were like, oh my god, this is so ridiculous. It's a bunch of celebrities you know, shining attention on themselves. I don't want anything to do with it. So kind of double-edged sword there. He's actually a nice guy. I know, it sucks. <laughs> you don't want to know that. Um, I've never talked to him, but we ended up on a, a bus together at South By with about 30 people just kind of touring around. And uh, 
you know, you get a sense about people. He was sort of a mother hen. He was sort of taking care of other people as they, you know, if they drank too much, he'd be the first one up to go help them if they were stumbling or getting sick. I was like, wow, I wouldn't expect that out of someone at that profile, especially because he was by far the most famous person in our little group there. Um, so, uh, you know, a little respect. Don't know him. Oh, I thought I saw a hand over there. I was going to say, so if you're a small business and you're starting a Twitter account, what's the suggested protocol for if people you know, follow you? Do you automatically <coughs> follow people back, or do you sort of focus in on a smaller influent, uh, audience that you really actually care about what you're saying? I'm really, really glad you asked that. So he asked, um, as a small business, do I follow everybody back? Yes and no. Um, so the first thing I'll say is decouple, as a business, your consumption of Twitter should have nothing to do with who you're following, right? You shouldn't rely, like I, I follow as many as humanly possible back. It's something like, I think I'm at roughly 95 following me and I'm following 93,000. Know, how can you follow 93,000 people? It's like, I don't. How do you read the entire internet? You know, you don't. Um, I use Twitter lists, right? So you can use Twitter lists to like, here are my customers, here are other businesses in my town, consume it that way. Um, you can use search tools. You can set up a, a different account that you're actually using to follow the people you want to read every day. So kind of decouple the experience of reading Twitter from the experience of having your corporate Twitter presence. Because here's the thing, if you don't follow them back, you're basically giving them the hand, right? It would be akin to setting up a website without a contact us page. It would be akin to not letting there be any way for someone to get in contact with your business privately if you don't let them DM you. And so I follow everybody back just for the purposes of letting them DM me. Um, <clears throat> when you have an account at reasonable scale, and mine is no longer at reasonable scale, the one exception will be when someone follows you and they're an obvious spammer, you're under absolutely no obligation to follow them back. But if they're a real human being and they have volunteered to be one of your fans and you're not even willing to give them a private ear, it, it's pretty disrespectful. And, and I don't think a lot of businesses really understand that yet. And I'm so disappointed. Twitter Pilot tested this, but it never went anywhere. One of the best features of their business accounts when they first announced them was it was going to have a setting to, by default, permit all the people who followed you to be able to DM you, and then you could shut them off if they turned out to be spammy, or you could report them as spammers or whatever. Um, I think it's a really big issue, actually, and a lot of companies don't follow them back. It's like you have 14,000 fans who love your Twitter account, and you're following 100 of them? Like, if I'm willing to give you my social media, and, and Twitter's sometimes way more social than Facebook, um, my social attention, and you don't even reciprocate that, it's like, eh, uh, it's mainly about the DMs really though, because realistically you're not gonna be able to, you know, if you get 2,000 following you and you follow all 2,000 back, that stream is now useless to you. But that's okay, because you really shouldn't be leaning on that stream anyway. You should use lists, you should use search for your brand name, search for customer terms, um, various tools that let you get some leverage in your search, especially if you can find people asking questions about what you do. Woohoo, bonanza, you know, great lead opportunity. But wonderful question, glad you asked it. I'll end with a challenge. Um, again, I'm old enough to remember not having email at work. <laughs> and, you know, when email first came in, you know, if, if you're still going, eh, Twitter. Imagine if someone ran up to your desk and you'd never seen email before and they installed an email client on your computer and said, boom, email is gonna change your business life and then walked away. And you were like, I don't know anybody's email address. <laughs> what do I do with this, right? So when people say, what is the business use of Twitter? I push back and say, what is the business use of email? Which departments in your company are touched by email? And obviously none, <clears throat> none aren't touched by email at this point. So whether it be Twitter, whether it be Facebook, whether it be a social platform we haven't even seen yet, it will permeate every department at some point. And so it's really important to keep a very open, exploratory, experimental mind about it. Thank you all. I'm going to let you guys go. If anybody wants to stay and keep asking questions.